So yeah, I saw you said, yeah, you were born or you lived your early life in Cornwall. Um, am I right in thinking like not many tours from, from bands go down there? Like what's the score? No, pretty much nothing. It's weird. I think Roger Taylor from Queen was born there. What's his face from Fleetwood Mac was born there. Mick Fleetwood was from St. Uh, okay. And that, while I was growing up, was pretty much it. For, although, funnily enough, until Coldplay and Muse came along, both of them were from the Southwest, Devon. So actually, when they got big, they would always play in Plymouth. But even that, for me, was two hours away. Nobody oh, came okay. down to Cornwall at all. There were just no venues there. And what it meant was, I was like, I, I started reading NME. I was big into Oasis as a kid. I don't know how I got into them, Top of the Pops probably. And then from that, I kind of gravitated to buying NME when I was an early teenager and just being very jealous about all this stuff that was going on all around the country. That there's, I had no hope in hell of getting up to Brixton Academy to see a band because it was like, well, how does a 14 year old kid get to London from Cornwall? Don't know anyone in London to stay with even. So yeah, it was. I was obsessed with the music, but it was so quiet down there. Right. Okay. Um, I was listening to a, a podcast the other day, and they visited every city in England for something they were doing, like a competition. And they said that um, they voted Plymouth number one city that they went to. So really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so great. I don't know if you got paid off by the tourist board or what, but yeah. Maybe. I don't know if I'd vote Plymouth as number one. No, no <laughs> offence to Plymouth. <laughs> yeah, fair but it's way. just very slow and it's very quiet down there. And there's, It's a lovely place to grow up. Don't get me wrong. It's beautiful. You, you're near the sea all the time. You're never further than like an hour away from an amazing beach. So on the one hand, you've got that. But culturally, you just feel really different. So basically, I grew up, I'd go to every gig that I could and the odd festival as well that I could afford and get to. And then by the time I was old enough to go to uni, I was like, right, I need to get the hell out of here and go and live a little bit. So I went to Chester, which is not amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Chester's not like cultural hub. It's just Hollyoaks hub. <laughs> <laughs> There's no gigs there either, but you are on the doorstep as I'm sure you know of Manchester and Liverpool. So that was around 2003, 2004. And by that point I was obsessed with strokes and everything that followed the strokes and white stripes so i just go and see sort of like the vines first gig sort of the sleepy jackson's first gig had seen the libertines first gig well my first gig of the libertines was one of their early tours i had a girlfriend who was living in liverpool uh, in chester sorry and i went to visit her before i went to uni and we went to see the libs play i think it was called stanley theater <clears throat> which is part of liverpool university and it was tiny, this room. It was, it actually, in retrospect, I think it was like a drama studio or something like that, that at night they just turned into a gig venue. It was just 100 people max, maybe. And this would have been after What a Waster came out, but before Up the Bracket. And honestly, it was probably the best gig I've ever been to. Because up until that point, the only gigs that I've been to have been big bands like Oasis, where... There's like 50 foot between the front row and the band on stage with security guards in it. Whereas this Libs gig, it was the first time I'd seen a band at their peak. They were incredible. It was like Beatles in Hamburg style incredibleness. And there was no security at all. And Pete and Carl were going down to the front row and nicking cigarettes out of people's mouths <laughs> and getting off with girls. Like literally they were. <laughs> it, was, it was off the scale. And I just lost it. I'd never seen anything like it. And I remember the other people, I remember actually before they came on, there was no support act and they just played the Vines debut album over the PA and everyone was sat down listening to it, which was really weird. And when they Everyone's came on- They all sat down? Yeah, it was a really <laughs> odd atmosphere. I'm pretty sure that even though I didn't know it then, a lot of members of the Zootons and maybe the Coral were in the audience, but they hadn't got to that stage where they were famous at that point because it just seemed like every head in Liverpool was there also James Endicott 
who I don't, has he been on the podcast? If he hasn't, no, I'd love to get him on. Yeah, I'll, I'll put you in touch with him. He'd oh, brilliant! Probably, yeah. He'd probably love it. But he was there, and I didn't know who he was. The only reason he stood out is because he's mad. He's got mad red hair, <laughs> big curly red hair. So it's kind of you see him, and you're just like, who's that guy who looks like a sort of red haired member of the Strokes? <laughs> and he was really, he's lovely, but he's quite antagonistic. And he shouts at his bands when they're on stage and he shouts and he's like, fucking rubbish. And it's kind of <laughs> G them up. And it really puts the audience on edge because everyone's like, oh my God, there's someone in the audience saying they're rubbish. But that's just James. And that's like some jokey thing that he has with the bands. And the bands, of course, just ignore it. And they go like, oh, it's fucking James. <laughs> Fuck it. Uh, so it's really weird. So I gathered that he was something to do with Rough Trade. And it was just, it was so, so exciting. I'd, I'd love to get a bootleg of that gig because they were incredible. And the other thing that stands out about it, right, and I've never seen this ever in any other band since, and I don't know why, because it's a genius idea. Between each song, obviously when you go to small gigs, it's quite awkward between the songs because there's only 50, 100 people there and they're all too cool for school. No one's clapping or anything like that. So you just kind of get silence. And what the Libs did was play this weird recording that they'd got and it was an old man laughing and a baby crying sort of mixed together weird right <laughs> so you'd have this sort of odd thing of you'd hear a baby crying really loud and an old man laughing between every song the band stayed fucking silent which i also thought was really cool because up until that point every gig i'd ever seen every band had just been like oh please like us thanks so much for saying this and this one goes out to you and it was just cheesy, whereas the libs were like dead-eyed, staring the audience out as if it's like, shit, are they going to like kiss us or are they going to punch us? <laughs> and then you have this weird soundtrack going on, quite sort of clockwork orange. And they were just, they blew my mind. That gig totally changed my life. And I was, I was already obsessed by the Strokes at that point. And I'd seen the Strokes at Brixton, which was amazing as well, but not as good. And when I saw the libs, that gig was phenomenal. It was so good. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think there's a lot of, like you say, like a band trying to crowd please? Do you think there's more of that now or do you think it's around as much as it ever was kind of thing? Um, I think if you look back at the history of rock music over the last 60 years since the Beatles, let's say, I think 95% of it people naturally fall into crowd pleasing. And I guess it's because bands get nervous on stage and it's just natural to say, thanks guys, you're sounding great. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But there's the odd band who come along. You hear it with the Beatles as well. The little comments that Lennon would make on stage, they were really sarcastic. They were almost taking the piss out of the fans and no one in the audience would get it apart from maybe 5% who'd be like, wow, can't believe you just told us to F off. <laughs> There's that odd 5% who always have it. And people like Fat White Family now, they have that as well, where they will kind of like stare out the audience and be quite antagonistic. But mm. yeah, I mean, I, it's a lot of bands I see now, I kind of think you don't need to say all this stuff on stage. Yeah, I think it's just about thinking about it. The Libs had obviously sat down at that really early stage and thought, how can we stand out? How can we be a little bit different? How can we make this a bit sort of, we love Warhol, so can we bring anything from that world into this? We love Sid Vicious, can we bring anything from that into this? Do you know what I mean? They just, they use their influences really well. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I think that's what people look for with bands is like mm. personality, but also like a genuine side to it as well. I think you can mm. see through anything that's contrived with a band as, as well. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, what point? So you moved back to Cornwall at some point. Is that right to work for? Yeah, a I did. I did journalism at uni, and it was good. The main aim I went to uni really wasn't for education. It was just to meet people and be independent, and hopefully get a degree at the end of it. And journalism at that point seemed quite an easy thing to do. And I, I, I always had an idea of maybe I can go into music. I go. I played guitar and stuff, but I worked out quite quickly I wasn't good enough to make it as a musician so I thought well next best thing is if I can work in the music industry I did journalism and it was all right and finished uni had no money obviously no real job prospects so I moved back to Cornwall lived with my parents again for like a year 
and I started at this little magazine called Stranger, which had just started up at that point. And it was great. It was, if anyone knows Little White Lies, the film magazine, it was almost like the sister mag to that. It was really thoughtfully put together. Um, <clears throat> the ethos was just about not doing the mainstream coverage and digging a bit deeper. So they took me on and they said, we can't pay you, but we can, you know, give you a title so we can call you music editor and we can show you how it works with music PRs and stuff like that. Um, and I did that and I started interviewing bands. I think the first interview I ever did was the bass player from a band called 2220s. Ah, oh, vaguely remember them, yeah. Yeah, they were on a lot of car adverts over the last sort of maybe not the last five years but before that they would turn up in when you go to the cinema you would always hear them on car adverts it's really weird obviously did a lot of good sync deals quite a good band um i think they supported oasis quite a lot actually and i did him as a phone interview but one of the first in-person interviews that i did was amy winehouse and we were lucky because we got her we were a small magazine. It was a real shock when we got offered that interview. It was like, wow. I think she was doing regional press and someone just, someone had obviously seen Stranger and thought, fuck it, they're tiny, but let's give them an interview. And we got her in this sweet spot when Back to Black had been released and everyone knew it was fucking huge. She'd won Grammys and Brits, but it was before the tabloids had really got stuck in. So people kind of knew from listening to the record that this is a record about drugs and drink and addiction. And she's singing it from the heart. She's obviously got issues, but it wasn't like she was on the front page of the sun every day. So it's this sweet spot. And that interview, well, it was so good. I went up to Bristol to do it. She was playing in a church. I think it's Trinity Church or something like that in St. Mark's. And we did the interview, sat on people's gravestones which really freaked me out because it's like, I don't know about you, but whenever I go to graveyards, I don't like stepping on graves. It just feels weird. <laughs> no, yeah. we, we had no option. She was sat on someone's grave and I was like, well, I'd better go and join you, I guess. <laughs> and it was part of a press junket. First time I've ever done anything like this. Never interviewed anyone in person before. And she's like God to me at that point. And I heard some of the other interviews that she was doing and they were really inane, awful questions, like tabloidy questions or like, so do you enjoy being famous and just <laughs> basic kind of like nothingy questions that didn't talk about the album at all and i'd obviously come at it from like a music geek point of view and i went in and i was like hey, what's your favorite girl group from the 60s what did you take from Sp phil Spector and the influence of him in making your record blah 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 and it was just fucking awesome she was such a good chat and i never forget at the end the pr came in and was like that's it, 10 minutes is up, because it was short. And Winehouse was like, nah, fuck her. He can have as long as he wants. Like, I fucking like him. And it was just like validation. I was like, fucking hell, this is mental. She's fucking said she wants to carry on. Wow. And I think I, I don't think I had anything else prepared. I think I had like one other question or something. So it's hilarious. But she was amazing. And I loved that record. And weirdly, going back to the libs, right? So I was properly obsessed with them i used to post on all the message boards i used to go to like as many gigs as i could i used to email pete <laughs> like i was fucking obsessed they were like my manix or my smiths you know those bands who people would tie themselves to they're always british bands oasis as well yeah and the lives the lives were that for me and in hindsight i kind of look back and i think well Obviously, it went tits up. But I think for about six months, which is a short amount of time, from the time What a Waster came out to the time the Time for Heroes single came out, which is about July 2002 to January 2003, I do think they were as good as any British band have ever been, which is a really big statement when you think about it. That's why I'm putting them on a par with Beatles, Oasis, they managed that for about six months and then the wheels started falling off and I still loved them. But in retrospect, it was like, oh man, it wasn't quite as good after that because they had all these issues. And what I was going to say about Winehouse is it's funny because it was almost a carbon copy of what Pete had gone through publicly a year before. 
all the fans could read into the songs that he was writing and was like, right, well, that's a heroin reference. That's a reference to Carl. That's a reference to the band breaking up. All these kind of mini references that he hid in his songs that actually a lot of music journalists missed and definitely a lot of mainstream press just didn't get at all. The fans knew, and that's why it was big on forums. And Winehouse was exactly the same. She dropped these references into the music. Back to Black. Black is drug slang. But it's also right. slang about Blake. And that album is about this love triangle with two boyfriends, one of whom is Blake Field of Civil and one of whom is another guy who I forget the name of. It's just like, it's an amazing story, that album. And it was weird to me because I knew Pete was a year in front of her and Pete was in a much worse place. So as a super fan, I could kind of be like, oh, fuck, Amy, don't continue down this road. But sadly, she did. And when you see the documentary, everyone knew that around her at the time and tried to stop it. But hmm. it's pretty, it's really sad what happened to her. I think it's probably the saddest thing in British music anyway, probably this millennium losing her. It's really bad. No, definitely, yeah. Um, yeah, do you think... Like the comparison with Pete and stuff, do you think it's, I don't know, do you think it's unavoidable that they go down that path or, I don't know, that's what it's hard to say, but do you think? Now that's an amazing question because yeah. I think it's, it's almost like do musicians take drugs or, to, or do drug addicts make music or art? Mm. Do you know what I mean? They're almost interchangeable. You know, are they, is Pete, are Pete and Amy more in it for the, freedom that doing those kind of drugs gives you or are they more in it for the freedom that music gives you and I think it's kind of neck and neck and I think in Pete's case if you read his diaries and his interviews and there's a great interview that he did around 2003 for a Dutch radio station where they ask him random questions that he's picking out of a hat or something like that and they're quite full-on questions they're questions like why do you take drugs and he is so unflinchingly honest. He's only like 22 at this point. And you listen to it and you're just like, wow, he, he knows what he is getting into. He knows. He's well aware that everybody from Thomas De Quincey to Sid Vicious to Kurt Cobain has flirted with heroin and crack. And nine out of ten times they don't get away with it. It ruins their lives. But one time out of ten, they do get away with it. <clears throat> they managed to come through the other side. And Nick Cave is a, an example of that. He was a pretty, you know, bad heroin addict in the 80s. And he's come through it. There's the odd person who is a success story. And I guess Pete was obsessed with the idea of just th having this opportunity where he's got a record deal with the hottest label in the world at that point, Rough Trade. And I guess it's that thing of they always used to say, we'll just throw ourselves into eternity and just see what happens. Yeah, yeah. I remember <clears throat> as a young kid, a bit younger than you, I think. Um, but yeah, I watched an interview around that time that was filmed around that time with Pete and Carl. And Pete was like talking about like life before the music. And he was like, oh, you know, we had, um, you know, we had football, and we had drugs. And like that kind of, yeah, like that honesty that he was comparing, he's putting drugs up there with. Yeah. any other hobby that he had yeah or anything he, important in his life and i found that quite mad at the time he's such a good person to interview <clears throat> i've done a bunch of interviews with him and none of them at the time when i was a super fan because too young i met him twice when i was a kid after that liverpool gig that i spoke about earlier this was so out of character for me as well i was like a shy really fucking shy painfully shy kid and they finished and they walked off stage and I ran into the dressing room. <laughs> there was like, there was one security guard like stood outside the side room. And I, because I was so small, it was like a crush of people getting out the venue. I was kind of able to sort of run through it like a sort of rat or something. <laughs> and I found, I found myself in the dressing room with just Pete and Carl. It was really fucking awkward. <laughs> and they were kind of looking at me. It's like, who the fuck are you? And how you, have you got in here? And I'm looking at them be like, oh, my God, what's happening? And I went up to... This is the first time I've ever met anyone in a band as well. So it's like a kid freaking out. And I went... Who did I go up to first? I went up to Pete first. They were sat at the opposite ends of the room and they just had like a table full of like chips, 
beer and stuff, crappy rider. And I went to Pete first, and I kid you not, he had a bag, he had two bags in his hand. One was a bag full of badges, Libertine's badges, which had like what a waste written on them, and another was a bag of powder. I don't know what powder it was. I'm like 15 at this point, <laughs> green as anything. <laughs> he like he weighs it up and he's like, take a badge. <laughs> and I'm like, come on, thanks, man. And then we have like a really awkward chat and he points me and Carl's start. I, I'm, I think I said something like, I fucking loved you and I've come all the way up from Cornwall. It took me nine hours to get here and you're the fucking best man ever. And he like just pointed me in the way of Carl. He's like, go talk to Carl. Carl's been to Cornwall. And I had a really awkward <laughs> mumbly chat with Carl. And then I left and I was like, wow. And the next time I met Pete was at that gig that I emailed you about in London, Christmas 2002. It was the Libs Christmas party. And funnily enough, I saw these kids in plastic red leather jackets outside the venue with Biro written on them. And they had the Paddingtons written on them. <laughs> Paddingtons hadn't released anything at this point. Maybe hadn't even played a gig, but they'd all come down on mass from Hull to go to the gig. And they stood out at that gig, actually. So that was oddly the first time I ever would have seen Tom as well. Didn't talk to him or anything, but... And that gig, that gig, there's two... Um, there's two videos of that gig, black and white, which are online, which get shitloads of hits. And the crowd are fucking crazy. The crowd ended up on stage. The band only managed five songs and then they gave up and walked off because it was just so like band in audience, audience on stage. There was like no security whatsoever. And it was just pure, unabridged, brilliant chaos. And so if you look at the those videos, the comments under them are all like, this is like the most insane gig of all time. And it fucking was like in the I was in the front row and Carl's guitar kept coming unplugged. So people were like holding the lead into his guitar while he was playing because it was people were stepping on it and stuff. And Carl was like falling over. I remember someone kicked me in the head and drew blood. So I'd like blood down my shirt. Shirt got ripped. It's fucking off the scale. And then afterwards, I met Pete again. I think White Sport played, who had Pat Walden and a couple of other future Baby Shambles members as well. And I think Pete might have even played with them that night at like 4 a.m. or something. And I met him after that and was just like, he's about eight foot tall, Pete. He's really, he looks like he's small, but he's not. And uh, I was just kind of in awe of him. But then the weird thing is I didn't meet him again for like 20 years or 15 years when I was at NME and I started interviewing him and I will say that as an interviewee him and Alex Turner are two of the most clever people who I've ever interviewed because they they say these things that at the time when you're listening to them you almost don't take in because they just fall out of their mouths as if it's the most natural thing in the world and then when you listen back, you realize how poetic they both speak. They're both really kind of eloquent and they say really deep things that they just all go over my head in the heat of the conversation. It's only when you listen back, you're like, wow, he said something really profound then. And Pete and Alex both got that continuously. I've interviewed Pete when he's been off his head at like 5 a.m. in hotel rooms. And I've interviewed him when he's been really lucid. And he's exactly the same in both situations. He's just got it in his brain he's a really intelligent guy yeah yeah i noticed that in um <clears throat> one of your interviews with matt and alex turner and uh alex turner just threw in something like yeah we celebrated like holyfield that just won the fight and it's just like that could easily be in an attic monkey song i know like one of their he lyrics. talks his lyrics yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. he's cool. an incredible he's a very very He's amazing, Turner. I think he's... I think basically Arctic Monkeys finished what the Libertine started. In a yeah. Way. I think he's almost underrated. I don't know. I don't know if, in terms I know what of... You mean. Say, like, all-time British songwriters, he's got to be level-pegging with anyone, in my opinion. But. Yeah. I think he's like modern-day Ray Davies. And I do think he's up there with, you know, the, the greats, the Knowles, the... Maccas, Lennon's not yeah. as good as Lennon McCartney, obviously, but he's he's in the league, definitely. Yeah, I suppose it's harder. I don't know, maybe it's harder now because it's all been done. Like you're never gonna change things like the Beatles did or Bowie did. Um, I do like the way that monkeys switch up their sound. 
Yeah, Thank yeah. You. When I heard Tranquility, I got played it like a week before it came out in Domino's listening room. Got a really nice listening room where like speakers are amazing. It's like comfy chairs. It's a great place to hear a record. And <clears throat> Lawrence, who is the head of Domino, who's like legendary indie stalwart in British music. He was making like zines back in the 80s and stuff like Lawrence knows his shit. He said to me, as he was walking out the door, he was like, because they leave you on your own to listen to it. He was like, by the way, I think it's their best album yet. <laughs> and I was like, wow, props. And I heard it. And then on the first listen, I was like, no way is that better than AM. It's really good, but it's too out there to be better than AM. But I listened to it the other day, Tranquility, and I was like, you know what? It's aging beautifully, that album. Yeah, and it, yeah. it, it may well be. It's so clever and so intricate that there is actually an argument for, for it being their best, in my opinion. Yeah, I remember when it came out and um, people were like, it was, in fact, it was Marv from the Paddingtons. He was like taking the piss. He was like, hey, all these Arctic Monkeys fans are going to say it's a grower and all this. <laughs> and uh, But it actually is. It's like yeah. a proper grower. Like if I think the title track from that album is one of the best songs I've ever done, definitely. Did you read that thing the other day that RZA from Wu-Tang came out? <clears throat> Someone asked him, Spin or something like that, was like, it's obviously an interview. It's like, what are your five favourite records at the moment? And all of them were like soul and hip hop. And then <laughs> Arts and Monkeys Tranquility was in there as like the fourth one or something. And he went <laughs> deep on Batphone, which is like one of the most <laughs> niche tunes the Monkeys have ever written. And he was like picking it apart and saying, yeah, this lyric is great. And like the orchestration is great. I was like, what the fuck? Like, how does that happen? And I was thinking, <laughs> for Turner, I bet he's happier that RZA has recognised it than any kind of kudos he's got from any music journalist over the last 20 years or anyone, like, in his world. Yeah, Because it means yeah. you've entered, like, another stratosphere of people like that are saying, yeah, that guy's good. Yeah. I saw you saying to Noah Gallagher as well that Morrissey was working with ASAP Rocky or something. Yeah. I have no that's... idea what that's going to sound like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I don't really know what I think about the Smiths now. I find him tough to listen to, but I love Johnny so much. Johnny's a, a legend. And I kind of feel sorry for Johnny in a way because Morrissey is you know, clearly unhinged, let's say. Mm. I think we all know what, what, what I'm talking about there. Yeah, but yeah. It's a weird one, isn't it? You look at if you look at art, you look at people like Caravaggio. He went around murdering people. And he was brutal, and people love his art. But that's five hundred years ago, whereas the Smiths is twenty, thirty years ago. Maybe it's too close. But I struggle a little bit to listen to them now because of everything that he said. Okay. Yeah. Um, where, like, quickly. I mean, we're going off on lots of tangents here, but quickly, where do you stand on band reunions, like? The Smiths have well, never done it, and I don't, personally, I don't think Oasis should ever do it. I think it's quite good the Smiths have never done it, but what's your take on it? Well, I, here's, here's a thought, right? Stone Roses. I think Stone Roses would probably have looked at bands like Kasabian, who effectively would not exist were it not for Stone Roses. Kasabian sound a lot like that band and always have done. And I think they probably would have looked at them and thought, fucking hell, Serge and Tom have got like mansions and they're <laughs> zillionaires. And we didn't get that much money from what we did because the Roses got, they signed shit record deals. They didn't really make much dollar at all. And they would have watched Oasis come in and absolutely rinse it three years yeah. later. They would have then watched all the noughties bands basically pilfer what they did and pay tribute to them as well. I'm not saying like Kasabian weren't gracious in that but the fact is they sound a lot like them and I think if a reunion means an amazing band get a payday I'm all right with it I'm kind of like you know what you deserve this Manny you deserve that house mm. you've worked your ass off for like 30 years one of the best British musicians ever all of them in that band even though Ian Brown obviously is in a Morrissey place at the moment in terms of everything that he's uh, saying. Yeah, yeah. You can't deny, great lyricist back in the day, great front man, unique as fuck. So in that situation, it's like, yeah, give them the payday. 
Do you know what I mean? And those Stone Roses gigs were great. I went to one of the Heaton Park ones and it was just celebratory. But should the mm. Roses have released those two new singles? Probably not. They weren't very good. They didn't really do what they needed to do. Um, I mean, similar with the Libs. I mean, we always... So I started at NME in 2008 and I was a massive Libs fan, even at that point, even though really by that point, Pete and Carl were both on the slide a little bit. And there were other, you know, Amy Winehouse had been and gone almost by that point. Claxons were happening at that point. You know, there was multiple scenes that had happened since 2002. Things moved really quickly. So even though I was obsessed, they were actually quite old hat, even by 2008, 2009. But I just, there were like two people at NME, myself and a guy called Jamie, who were obsessed with them. And we would, it was our dream to get Libs back together and do the NME piece about it. And we kind of worked quite tirelessly at trying to make it happen. Like we'd always try and do like joint covers for the 10th anniversary of Up the Bracket and try and get Pete and Carl in the same room together. Because at that point they were kind of talking, but not publicly. And it was such a mission to do because one of them would, well, usually Pete would always pull out at the 11th hour. So when they finally did get it together and they announced, they did kind of reunited twice. They did that thing in 2011 where they played Reading and then they went mm. silent for ages. And then in 2015, I think they did Hyde Park and that was a proper reunion. And I was pleased. I was like, you know, for those guys, it's similar to the Stone Roses, you know. I do think there's an argument that the Libs are not very in vogue at the moment. And I think that's just because music goes around in circles and their time will come again in five, ten years' time when fans will start referencing them again. That time isn't now. But they were really important to British music. They galvanised British music. Arctic Monkey probably wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Libertines. You know, there's that famous photo of Alex Turner with Pete and Carl in the guards jackets outside Ali Pali or something. You know, <laughs> they're an important band. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm all right with it, personally. Yeah. I mean, some bands really pulled it off. I think Blair really pulled it off. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah I made... guess it's down to each band, I suppose, really. Yeah. Um, right, yeah, so going back to your career, you end up, like you say, you went to Enemy, you end up new music editor at Enemy. And mm. I was just interested, you said like the Amy Winehouse interview was a catalyst for that. Um, was that in terms of your own self-belief as well as how others perceived you at that point? Yeah, a little bit. Partly because of that thing that she said at the end of the interview. She yeah. was like, now nah, fuck it, he can have five minutes more. That was like, wow, I'm obviously doing something right here. But the main kind of, um, I guess it was weird because I, I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. It was so difficult to break into the music scene. And for, for anyone who's like, maybe there's people listening out there who are like, well, how do I get into it? And it is like, it's 50% luck and it's 50% perseverance. You have got to be a bit annoying and you've got to keep hitting people up, but in a polite way. So with NME, I knew people are uncut which is a sister title to NME. It was like the, the older magazine of NME. They cover music from the 70s, 80s, 90s. NME would be more new. And I knew a guy called Alan Jones there, who's a fucking legend. He was like Joe Strummer's mate in the 70s, he used to live with him in squats. Lou Reed liked him. And Lou Reed liked nobody. <laughs> He's got a great book, Alan Jones, called Can't Stand Up for Falling Down, which is just his stories of meeting people. And he was the only other person in the world in music who I knew who was obsessed with baby shambles. He loved Down in Albion and thought it was like as good as Lamp, like a motherfucker by, who did that? It was like the Heartbreakers. I can't remember. Right. Johnny Thunders, I think. He was like, he was like, no, this is proper punk rock. And I used to email him and I used to beg him to try and get me into Uncut or NME and it didn't really happen. But I knew a couple of people then. I knew Anthony Thornton, who wrote the Libertines book as well, just through emailing. And, um, and a job came up at NME that they advertised on the website saying, we're looking for a new news writer. And I was like, I've got to get this job. And I just sent, 
you know at school when you send when you when you when they're telling you how to apply for a job they sort of say right ease yourself into it in the letter explain calmly who you are and then work up to the point of why you think you'd be great for this job I just ignored all of that I was like they're going to get thousands of people emailing this guy is going to be bored shitless of reading all these emails so I'm just going to say my name is Matt Wilkinson and I have interviewed Amy Winehouse and Mr Razcox the Libertines first drummer and I need to work at NME and that was it that was like first sentence and then I just copied the interviews in and it fucking worked and he got back to me and he was like great can you come in on Monday and I didn't even have an interview they just tried me out straight away and years later this guy's called Paul Stokes he was like yeah that if you hadn't if you'd have put the Amy Winehouse line like in the middle of the email I wouldn't have even got to it because the volume of emails we got was just so heavy that I just I had to kind of look for things that jumped out and obviously an Amy Winehouse interview by a kid jumped out at me so that was how I got started at NME and I just kind of I just never really looked back as soon as I got my foot in the door I was like right I've got one foot in now I'm, I'm not going to leave until I want to leave on my terms and I was there I think for like eight years in full quite a long right. time cool so what you had uh, what years was this sorry uh 2000 maybe 2009 to 2016-ish I think uh, okay so that when was it was still a magazine yeah yeah mm. and we had Colin McNicholas on that sounds like you started just as he was leaving them yeah I I think I had about six months with him and I didn't really chat to him that much but he was dude actually I like Colin I think, he's, I think he was great great kind of mouthpiece for that magazine he really understood what how important strokes were and white stripes and he went to town on it and he carved an identity for it as well which i think it got more difficult as the strokes boom died a little bit and music got more diverse i think enemy kind of struggled to find to work out where its voice was overall but individually like I loved what I did in the magazine, and I think there were amazing, really talented writers there when I was there as well. Really good people. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned like uh, some very good bands that are just starting out, like Tame Impala, Wolf Alice. Was that kind of? It's obviously different to the early nineties, but still a very exciting time, kind of thing. Well, there was always one band a year that I was really excited about. I don't know why that is, but they're always just, I could, I was quite confident that like at some point this year, someone will come along and they'll be amazing. And Tame were definitely something like that. But it, but when Tame started, right, the horrors were really big at that point. They just released that album, Primary Colours, which is a, still think that's a five-star record. Brilliant. Um, and everyone at NME, myself included, just thought, well, Tame are like the Aussie version of the horrors. They're never going to break that ceiling. They're going to be a really good, indie band they're never going to go mainstream or anything and then we had elephant on album two <laughs> it's just like what the fuck this is like <laughs> the biggest song of the decade <laughs> it's like fucking next level and it is and it's like i think like blackberry bought it and put it on an advert in yeah, America for like that, yeah. a year or something and it just made them huge and it was clear that we'd kind of underestimated them a little bit even though we loved them, they were very much like a cult band. They were never going to get a cover at that point. And then when that record came out, they still didn't get a cover, actually, which pissed me off. I lobbied for it, and for some reason they didn't get one, which is wrong in hindsight. They should have totally got it. Um, but yeah, they're amazing. I love Pond as well, who were the like, spin-off band that mm. uh, share members with Tame. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did they do something else with... It's like a, a former girlfriend or something. I remember they released a really good song. Yeah, Melody's Echo Chamber. That's all, he was yeah, yeah. he was so prolific. That was the same period as um as Lonerism. And in that year or thereabouts, he did a record with Pond called Beard Wide Stenim, which I think is one of the best albums of, of the decade. It's like the band or Led Zeppelin is fucking off the scale. He did that. He drummed on it and he produced it, and the drums are amazing on it. And then he co-wrote, I think and definitely played on and produced the Melody's Echo Chamber album, and he did Lonerism, all in the same year. It's mad. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing to see where they've got to now. Like, uh, Huge. 
he'll never <clears throat> for me I'll, I don't know it'll always be the early albums that are the first two but I kind of really appreciate how good they are now still it's like more like almost disco now isn't it yeah well so many bands try to get that sound now it's mad the amount of new bands coming through where it's like you've listened to a lot of Tame Impala haven't you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That kind of solitude is bliss pedal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He should do a pedal, actually. He really should do a line in pedal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Yeah, and then he said he became... You talked about interviewing Stro- um, Liberty and Arctic Monkeys, but you also said you interviewed... Or you could become the go-to guy for the enemy in terms of interviewing the Strokes. Like, what was that like? Well, they didn't give us very much while I was there, but what they did give us, I I was lucky enough to do. So I did, I didn't do them. This is when they weren't really talking. They went through a long period where they didn't do any interviews together. I did like one. And it, even that interview was really frosty because it was pretty well known. Like they were, I just, I just think they didn't get on for a long time. And they realized the Strokes is a cash cow and that when they do play electricity happens and it's incredible and it's worth keeping it together. But I don't think they hung out for a long time. So I did mm. like, I did, I did Albert in WizKid's offices. WizKid is Ryan Gentles, who was their manager up until recently, actually. He did it from Strokes, uh, from his to see it onwards. And WizKid's office was great. It's like, I don't think it's there now, but it was heart of Manhattan. It's just exactly what you think the Strokes management office would look like. It's just like something out of the 70s. It was fucking cool. <laughs> and I did an Albert chat there. And I'd known, I kind of heard on the grapevine that he had had a kind of his issues with addiction. Um, but no one had asked him about it. And I, it pissed me off because he'd do loads of interviews and everyone would, you know, it's a big part of his life. And it's fair to ask that as a journalist. You know, if he says, sorry, I don't want to talk about it. That's cool. You leave it and move on. But he might not. He might be willing to talk about it. So I just asked him during that interview. And I was like, I can't remember the exact question I said, but it was something simple like, I'm aware that you've had issues with drugs and alcohol. How bad did it get? And he just looked me in the eye and he was like, you really want to know? And I'm like, yeah. And he just listed this thing. He was like, all right, for two years, I couldn't wear T-shirts because I had so many holes in my arm from injecting ketamine and heroin and blah, 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 blah. And he listed what he would do and it was shocking it was like fucking hell i did not know it was going to be like that and that was like a really illuminating moment and like quite a heavy interview and uh, I, I loved him for saying that because he's totally cool with it you know he's like i've come through it it's a shit period of my life but it took over for like five years and it really caused problems and if you read meet me in the bathroom I'm not sure whether the strokes yeah. talk about it, but people around them definitely do. And you, you, you realise from that how big it actually was. Like he'd be nodding out in the studio and stuff and it'd be really, really difficult. But he's a, he's a good dude, Albert. I've met him a couple of times since then and he's, he's in a really good place now. And he's a fucking amazing musician as well. And then Julian, we, did, we chased Julian for ages and ages. He just wouldn't do anything. <laughs> and we got word at South by Southwest that the Voids were going to do a secret show, which obviously meant Julian was in town. And I just put an email out to their people who I'd been chasing for like years saying, he's here, I'm here. What do we need to do to make this happen? I just want like 15 minutes with him. And he just signed this band Cerebral Ballsy to his, to Cult, to his label. And they were there as well. And I knew them a little bit. And I was like, why don't we do a joint interview where we get Honor, their front man, and Julian together. And it's a bit of PR for Colt. And, you know, we put them both on the cover. And they're into it. And <laughs> South by Southwest, if you didn't know, it just takes over the whole of Austin in Texas, the whole city. So it's like the Great Escape times 100. Like everywhere, it's just music, music, music. People are playing in like barber shops and fucking off licenses. Like they're just gigs everywhere. It's chaos. So there's no way that we can book to do this interview because all the hotel rooms are taken, all the like conference rooms at the conference center are taken. So we do, we end up doing it in an Airbnb that my mate Dan was staying in. And there were loads of people staying there. I remember Hugh Stevens was staying there as well, actually. There was like 10 people from the music industry staying there. 
and I walked in. It was the only place to get because it was out of town, so it meant Julian wouldn't be mobbed like if people saw him or whatever. And uh, it was comfortable-ish. And I pull up to this house. I get there like half an hour before, and I walk in, and it fucking stinks. It's like it just smells of like bloke, <laughs> ten blokes, <laughs> all like pissed. Like a <laughs> yeah. It just stinks of like chips and feet and bo and beer and fucking everything. And I'm like, are you kidding me? We're bringing Julian Castablancas to do an interview here, and he's arrived in ten minutes. Wow. <laughs> and he fucking credit to me, he arrived and he was totally cool. And he did it, sat on my mate Dan's bed. And I realized during the interview that Dan, he's a legend, Dan, he manages bands now, Mr. McAvoy. He'd left a pair of fucking dirty underwear or something like that on the bed. <laughs> Julia's hand kept creeping ever closer to this pair of kecks. And I'm like, don't fucking touch the kecks. <laughs> it's like the most weird, like Monty Python situation. <laughs> but I've got to say, he was fucking amazing. And it's probably because we had Honor there and Honor was asking good questions as well. Honor was a mate of mine, this guy from Cerebral Ballsy, and I know that he was kind of quite in awe of, of knowing Julian as well. So we were asking him, like, it's really fucking cool stuff, like, did you ever meet Lou Reed? And I didn't know this, but he was like, yeah, Lou Reed did a book signing at whatever the big department store is in New York when we were just starting the Strokes, and me and all the band ran up when we found out, and we queued, and we bought the book, and we got him to sign it to the Strokes, and we shared the book out, one of us got it for like a month and then we passed it to the other one and then the other one and then the other one. How nice is that? That's it, yeah. It's cool. He was great. Did, didn't they end up singing on stage at one point or something? Yeah, they oh, did a great yeah. cover of Walk on the Wild Side. They did, they did it twice. I got both bootlegs. One of them was not great. I don't know why. The recording isn't great. And um, one of them is amazing. And it's like, they are so tight. I don't really know what Lou does because you can't really hear him. I think he might have just been stood there like vibing Bez style <laughs> right. or like singing backing vocals maybe because he doesn't sing the lead. Julian does the lead. But yeah, they actually, they did an NME cover before I joined as well, actually. Which oh, is right. really good. Yeah. It's mad. Cool. But do you think Julian's quite sceptical of NME in general or, well, or not really? If you look... I know, I'm going to sound like a major geek here, but if you look, I think it's 2006 NME Awards. He go, they, they win Best International Band and they go on stage and he says, sort of mumbles a few thank yous. And then he says, you know what, NME, it is the best music magazine in the world. Thank you, NME. And he walks off. And I think in their hearts, the thing that pissed me off about Meet Me in the Bathroom, the book, is it's written from an American perspective. And what... Lizzie, who's a great writer, and she's been on the show, she's a lovely person, but what she missed is the fact that the UK was so crucial to breaking that band. The UK broke that band, America followed. Rough Trade signed them, first of all. NME gave them their first ever cover. Reading gave them their first ever headline festival slot. Top of the Pops gave them, I think, their first ever TV performance, maybe apart from MTV, but first, like, mainstream one. We were fucking, we broke that band. And I don't think the book conveys that well enough. The book is like, spin were really important. Fuck that. Spin were fucking not important at all. <laughs> NME obsessed with that band. And they fucking, if you read the history, and you know the history, the deputy editor of NME at that point, basically the editor was on maternity leave or something like that. So the deputy editor took over and the dep ed on like week one of being in control heard the strokes and was like, right, Fuck Travis, fuck Coldplay, fuck New Metal. This is what we're doing. And if the editor had been there, there's no way he would have allowed that because it's too risky. Yeah. Big risk doing something like that. It's the fact that the editor wasn't there and the dep ed, a guy called James Oldham, was like, no, this is the band who we're putting all our money on. All of it. Hundred or nothing. <laughs> he fucking, he's instrumental in breaking that band. And I think... Julian, heart of hearts, knows that. And I think obviously Enemy is like, you know, they, they, they do, there, is an, there was an element of building bands up and then breaking them. But they never did that with the Strokes. They always fucking loved the Strokes. 
they never slag the strokes off really yeah yeah <clears throat> i always thought there was a bit of a, a weird thing about room on fire where people i don't know some critics didn't seem to rate it but i never understood that i think i don't it's know a, if that's been forgotten about now but i listened to it recently i got it on vinyl and i i loved it i thought this is growing old incredibly yeah, but at the yeah. time 1251 felt like an anti-climax i remember listening to it just as a fan and it was like wow it's kind of like the is this it stuff but not quite as good and i think that's because it wasn't a big bang it is a great single i do think it's a bit of a classic now when they play it live it is it's amazing but at the time it just didn't feel bombastic enough and also at that point the libs were in the uk whereas the strokes came to the uk for two weeks every six months the libs were here every single week and you would open up NME and it'd be like, what's Pete done this week? What's Carl done this week? And it would be, you know, I mean, you know what it's like, it's like EastEnders, the amount of, kind yeah. of ups and downs and lefts and rights that that band had. It was just incredibly exciting. And they did that for a while. And then obviously Arctic Monkeys came along and immediately it was like, boom, you know, arguably bigger than both the strokes and the libs straight away and have been ever since. Yeah. Um, so going back to you then, um, and making the switch to radio, uh, or working for Apple, right? can you tell us how that happened? Well, I, I obviously listened to Zane a lot on Radio One. I can't remember when he started, but actually I saw, I would have been, first become aware of him maybe on Radio X, but definitely when he was doing Gonzo on MTV which I still think is one of the best things he's ever done. It's just, it's, if you watch him back now, it's so free flowing that program. Yeah, I'd is. love to do something as good as that. I just think he's, he was a master at that. And, um, and I, I, he was on radio one as well. And I would have listened to him. And at some point I interviewed him while I was at NME. Cause he did quite a lot of stuff with us. And it was only a phone interview. And at the end of it, I just said, I don't know if you know, but I do new music at NME and you do new music at Radio 1. Can I get your email? I wouldn't mind sending you some stuff that I'm into and then maybe you can send me some stuff that you're into and we can help bands grow. And, and he gave it to me and I sent him this artist almost immediately who's called Shamir. And he was sort of XL recordings type artist. I think they signed him for album one, but he was unsigned at that point. And I just remember Zane played it that night. I just happened to be listening and he played it and he was like, shout out Wilco from NME. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. Uh, and that was like maybe a year before we, we worked together properly. In that year, he left Radio 1. And he did, I think when he left, he said, I'm leaving to go to Apple. Apple are doing something. Because this is before Apple Music had started. So it was a big thing of like, well, what's he going to do at Apple? And obviously people would put two and two together and be like, oh, they're launching a radio station or something. Um, but I, I didn't know what was going on. And in that period where he was off, because he took like six months off to basically work out what Apple Music was going to be, he emailed me. And he kept saying, do you want to meet up? I'm, gonna, I'm between here, London and LA, but let's meet up when I'm next around. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to. I had no idea what it was for. I thought it was just like, for a coffee or something and then we finally meet up in this cafe and as i'm walking there it suddenly dawns on me i'm like shit what if he's tapping me up for like some kind of job at apple and I, and he was and he was kind of like have you ever thought about working in radio and i said no literally never crossed my mind but i've thought about it for three seconds and yeah love the idea of it <laughs> that's literally what i said and zane if you've ever met him is like he is totally to the point he's very surefire in what he says i think that meeting only lasted like five minutes as soon as i said that he was like right cool it's enough for me i'll be in touch see you later bye <laughs> <laughs> he still didn't know what he was doing at this point didn't know what it was called didn't know like anything about what he wanted me to do i was just like what what happened there that was mad and that was how it started and uh i did my first show the week that we launched, which is in 20, summer 2015. And it's, yeah, I just never really looked back. 
it's really nice correlation between what I did at NME and what I do now. It's basically just I used to write it at NME and now I just talk it. Yeah. So it's a combination of playing new music and speaking to different bands. Basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And, and the interviews are fairly similar as well. They're just like, there's no real like rules. We're very, the thing with us is we're music first. So it's like, you know, it's not that, that tabloidy, our interviews. Yeah, yeah. So is that a massive, obviously brand new to radio? Is that kind of just learning on the job or how does it work? Totally learning on the job. I'd never been live before until we were actually live and when you wow. before you go live you have I'm wearing headphones now and it's like this and you have someone in your ear <clears throat> who's like the I don't know what their job title is even they 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 switch the show on so that you're live and they'll count you down and they'll be like right you're all, you're live in 10 9 <laughs> 8 7 and that countdown was really nervy as we got closer <laughs> to one I was like what is happening but then you're in and you just talk and it's fine and it happens and it's like, cool, ah, it's quite easy. But the best way is to learn on the job. I didn't have any formal training. Um, being on camera, I'd never really done that before as well. And that's like really weird, just having like video, uh, proper like expensive cameras pointed at you from like multi directions. <laughs> it's an odd situation. That is different, I guess, because when you, at NME, it would obviously, the interviews would be me and the person I'm interviewing locked in a room, no one else in there. Whereas when you do this, by the nature of it, there's a sound guy and there's a camera guy and there might be a PR and there might be my producer. You know, there's multiple people listening yeah, and then outside the room, there are loads of people editing it and, and stuff like that. So it is, it's different in that respect. But I've got to say, you do get to the point in interviews where all of those people are just blocked out. And I don't know how it happens. You just don't notice them and you're just staring at the person you're interviewing. And it's like, there is nothing that could sort of break into that little bubble that you form. It's quite weird when that happens. Mm. It does happen. And obviously, you know, a huge list of people you've interviewed. Um, <clears throat> Gallagher Brothers, Iggy Pop, um, Josh Hom, the Rolling Stones. Um, uh, what is the secret to a good interview, do you think? Um, knowing your subject as much as possible and their music. That's okay. probably the number one thing, actually. Because I kind of like... The Noel one is a really good example of this that I did recently. I kind of knew what he was going to answer to every question. Because... I really researched them. And obviously I'm a massive fan anyway, so a lot of it does come quite naturally to me. But it was like, cool. I know if I bring up Neil Young, I know that he's met him over the years and I know that he played with him in 94. So I know that being Noel, you know, that kind of craggy smile that he has, he loves to tell a story. All I need to do is mention those magic words, Neil Young, and he'll go into a story. And he kind of did. And it's all that, it's that thing of just knowing what they're about and the kind of things that will set them off and that they'll enjoy talking about. Because if they enjoy talking about it, then they'll just they'll, they'll go on for hours. Yeah, yeah. And that's when you know it's good. That's when you know you're having a good interview. What about in terms of, I don't know, I suppose, like obviously this podcast for me has been a bit of a crash course in interviewing people, but... Um, in terms of your approach, you try and approach every interview the same in terms of just being yourself kind of thing? Uh, I don't really think about how I approach it that much. Okay. But I think I approach every interview differently because each subject is different. And each, even if it's like, you know, did a Beck interview recently, and I've, I think I've interviewed Beck like three times. I've, I've approached that differently each time because it's been about a different project. And right. he's someone who changes so much that it's never the same conversation really. Um, but I think it's funny because listening to your podcast, you can hear it like in the early episodes, you can hear that like you're not a, a kind of a paid journalist doing this. You're a fan who's doing this, who wants to kind of break into that world. And I do think that you're you can really hear it, how you've improved. And Tom as well, like the line of questioning has improved and the way that you approach the interviews has, has improved. And it's, it's not to say one is better than the other. 
because they're all really good conversations. But you can literally hear you getting better on the job and on the podcast. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. No, I've been. I learned, you seem to learn something from every episode almost. Yeah, I bet. Um, and oh yeah, I was going to ask you something actually. Like, I mean, you get and it's pretty unlimited. Uh, you know, the podcast, this podcast in terms of time, as long as people can uh, give the podcast. But when you've got, is it 15 minutes you've got with no or something like that, a short time? We like, actually had, we actually had 40 minutes with him, which is longer uh, than you right. normally get for someone big. Although I have to say the Gallagher's, they are good. I think when Liam's been on, we've had about that with him as well, which is mad. But sometimes you get, Sometimes you get like five minutes. It's mad. We did a thing with Miley Cyrus when she did a collab with Mark Ronson. They came in and it was like, right, you got five minutes. Miley's got to do like whatever, the biggest TV show in America in 15 minutes. Hard exit. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, you, can, you do not mess around. There's like, there's no, there's no kind of chit chat beforehand. Put it that way. Yeah. You're straight in. <laughs> I suppose something I've had to do, not deal with, something I've kind of found is that uh, you might be really happy with an interview just afterwards. Like the Cribs is a good example with Ryan Jam, and I was really happy with that. And then a couple of weeks down the line, you think, I didn't ask him anything about songwriting. <laughs> yeah, but I, no, I do that all the time. Yeah. That's just natural human self criticalness. You. All the time I listen back to stuff and I think, oh, you idiot. Why did you not follow it up with that? Yeah. And you cannot get it right. Listen, I've never had an interview where I've listened back or heard bits of it back or read it back or whatever and thought, yeah, nailed it 100%. I don't think it exists that way. I just think yeah. you, the aim is, you know, you, in terms of your planning, you should highlight what are the key points I want to talk about? And it could just be a list of bullet points. You know, you don't need to go that in depth on it. Mm. And then as long as you hit them or even like four out of the five of them, then it's fine because a lot of the time you can't tell what the person you're interviewing is going to be like. They could just go off on one and yeah. talk for hours and hours and hours. And before you know it, it's like, shit, I've run out of time because they've kind of just spoken all this amazing stuff, but it's nowhere near what I wanted to talk about. And that does happen sometimes, but that's just the nature of, you know, it's human nature, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Right, I'll, my way I've taken up quite a lot of your time, mate, so I'll try and hammer through. Great. Yeah, it's been nice. Um, just try and hammer through some of those ones I sent you. Um, actually, I wanted to ask you, what's the difference? I've only done this over Zoom, you see. So what's mm. the difference between doing it in person and doing it on Zoom, do you think? Uh it is better in person, but we've all got, got used to Zoom now. Before COVID, we would do phone interviews with people who weren't in London or whatever. And they were always a little bit awkward and a little bit stilted. And, you know, the gap, the like one second delay or whatever was always really awkward. But people have, because we've done it so much, people have sort of just got used to it. So that it is a much better thing than it was. But you can't be it in person, really, because you can really connect with people in person. And you can, you know, it's that thing of like being able to look into the whites of people's eyes and and really kind of just get that connection. Yeah, in person is always like my preference. Yeah. Um, what's the best and worst interviews you've done, do you think? Um, if you can narrow it down, I don't know. Best... Probably the most exciting. Well, Wide House is the, what is the most special one. But if we move that aside, because we've already spoken about that, doing the Stones was mad. Because we did all of them, but they did it separately, but they did it one after the other. Right. And this is when they opened that exhibition thing that they had, which is brilliant as well. Oh, yeah, I remember. And that, yeah. we did it in New York, in the place where the exhibition was. So we had all, like, Keith's guitars hanging up behind us and stuff. It was mad. And... Um, and obviously I'm really nervous because it's the stones and it's big and it's been filmed. It's the first big film thing that I'd ever done. And I knew it's for Apple. And it's like, wow, it's going to be a big audience for this. 
And I'd heard the record, which was Blue and Lonesome, that blues covers record that they did. I got the, the jump on that. So I was able to listen to it like a month before and it was a really good album. So I knew it was a good Stones album as well. So I wanted to do it justice. And, um, and we guessed before me and Francis, who's helping me from an Apple point of view, we were like, right, the order they'll go in will be Charlie first, then Ronnie, then Keith, then Mick. It will be building up to Mick. That's the order that they'll want to do it in. And we guessed it completely right as well. It's almost like in order of not importance, but who cares about it the most in the Stones camp. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And Charlie, bless him, waltzes in looking like the coolest motherfucker on the planet. He's in like the sharpest suit. I remember that his socks match the color of his belt or something like that just like he had all these like amazing kind of fashion little nuances about him like amazing cufflinks and stuff and he walked in with an espresso <laughs> looked like an italian mobster or something and the way he sat was just sort of slouched cross-legged and was, he just looked cool as fuck and he was quite tough to interview he, just, he notoriously doesn't do that many interviews and he's just people think he's grumpy but i just think he's he's straight up and he's very to the point so he was quite kind of just in at the deep end, really. And when you look at that interview, it looks like it's just us in this room. But my view, I had Charlie opposite me. And then to the right, there's about 50 people watching. I'm not kidding you. Because wow. each of the stones has their own individual manager. They have their own individual, like, uh, PA assistant person. They've all got clothing people with them. We had to wear like, makeup and stuff because of the cameras. There's, like, heads of record labels there. It's fucking big man it's big there's loads of camera people as well and i'm just like fuck me this is mental and they said to me before and they were like by the way we don't want any notes in this so you can't use notes uh you're gonna have to just do it from memory we don't want any like don't be checking your phone or don't like hold a piece of paper or a card with it wow so now i only found that out half an hour before i thought i was gonna be able to do that so <laughs> that freaked me out kind of as yeah, well yeah. Uh, but Charlie was great. And then Ronnie, I'd actually met Ronnie at NME before a few times and he was great. He's just a lovely, lovely guy. Very personable. So he kind of set me at ease a little bit. And then Keith walks in and I was just like, fuck me. This is the coolest moment of my life. Like Keith fucking Richards does not get, <laughs> does not get any better than this. And he was amazing, man. He was smoking, which I'm pretty sure is probably illegal somewhere. It's probably something that says you're not allowed to smoke on TV now, but we let him get away with it because it's Keith Richards. How do you tell Keith Richards to put a ciggy out? You can't. <laughs> he walks in with like a fucking cocktail and a ciggy. It's just fucking cocktail. amazing, man. And um, I gave him this. My mate, Dan, he's fat. He's Mexican and his family knew, the f they knew this blues guy called Big Bill Brunsey, who's a legendary blues man from the 30s and 40s in the states and i knew that keith was he's like his number one fan and dan my friend said i met him the night before and he was like i've got to give you this it's a cd that my family recorded of brunzy playing in our kitchen it's never been released this is like from the 30s and we've got we've got like we pressed it onto records just for the family it's like ultimate rarity give keith a copy you'll fucking love it and i did at the end and explain the story and he was like so personal he was like wow fucking yeah fucking really appreciate this man thank you and i was like no shit just got through to keith like made a connection to keith <laughs> and then after he finished right there's like a half hour wait for jagger which is the most jagger thing ever because <laughs> he's literally like i don't know what he's doing oh we, we kept getting word that he's like he's not ready he's not found the right shirt yet he keeps trying different shirts and he's got all these like Dolce & Gabbana shirts or whatever up there. And he's like, no, 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 this one's not right. <laughs> and uh, eventually walks in and it was, I was scary because he is one of the most famous people on planet Earth. And, um, and kind of like, it was one of those moments where everybody else just faded into black at the edge of the room and it was just me and him. And the great thing about Jagger is that he gives as good as he gets in an interview. He's quite combative in a way whereas the other stones are kind of like they're not like that they're more personable and it's more chit chatty jagger is like q a q a q a q a and if he doesn't like something that you say he'll fight it which is really rare 
in musicians normally they just kind of bend to what you say and they'll they if they don't agree with it they'll find a polite way of saying so whereas jag will be like well no i don't think you've got that right what it actually was was this and i'm going to tell you my point of view and he did that a couple of times in the interview and i really liked it actually it was really nice it was refreshing to kind of be faced with that kind of um i don't know almost like sword fighting type joust of an interview and it was just the whole thing was mad and i got photos with them afterwards and it was like obviously they were like official photos but i was just like a kid being like passed around to the stones to have like a fucking cheesy photo taken with him but the keith one is probably the best photo i've ever been in my life he looks amazing yes sounds mega um so good man just so good i was listening to sopranos podcast the other day um don't know if you're into it but yeah. one of the um the guy who plays christopher was saying the stones were really into soprano so they invited him over and <laughs> for a gig and uh yeah he said mick was the only one that didn't have any time for him but he probably went into the show or something so i don't know he's probably trying to shirt on <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. i did love that of all of them the one who's late is mick because he's not happy with the way he looks that's the most yeah. mixed thing ever, you know? Brilliant. <laughs> okay, so then flipping that, then what's... Is the worst. Interview, do you think? I don't think there is, actually. Um, I've touched wood. I've never had a nightmare interview. And I hope I never do. Most people are, are great. Most people that I've met have been really nice. I guess you could say... There was like the, the Libertines ones and the ones with Pete have been the most difficult because Pete is erratic and chaotic in his nature. So Pete's ones are the ones where it's like, you know, most normal interviews happen between nine and five in a day in a pre-organized place. Pete's interviews are meant to happen at like 10. It rolls on through the whole day then the evening and then you get a call at like 2 a.m and it's pete being like oh, i'm really sorry but i couldn't do the interview today but I'll, I'll call you in the morning and we'll do it and i'm like okay cool great please let me do it because otherwise i'm gonna get in trouble <laughs> <laughs> and then you get a set like one in glasgow that i did i literally got woken up i was staying in a hotel this is after they played barrowlands i stayed in a hotel and it, we were meant to interview them all together it didn't happen and i did the other three all together and it was like sorry Pete's somewhere we can't find him and um and I get a call I get woken up at like 6 a.m and it's him and he's like Do you fancy doing the interview now and I'm just like yeah where <laughs> at this point I'm desperate and he's like come up to my hotel room 200 or whatever and I do and we do this interview it's just, I knock on his door and I thought we were going to do the interview in his hotel room and he answers the door and he's like, shh, my girlfriend's asleep. Girlfriend, Cassie is asleep. I don't want to wake her. Let's do the interview in my van. And he's got a sort of Breaking Bad style van, camper van. Right. That is, is bad. This camper van is about 300 years old. It goes about 10 mile an hour. The windscreen's broken. It's got parking <laughs> tickets all over it. So the most- Who is this, sorry? Pete Doherty. So this is like the most like battered camper van ever. <laughs> this is in Glasgow. And um what year is it, sorry, and, Matt? Oh, um 2016, this is. Oh, okay, right. When they reformed for Hyde Park, it was a couple of gigs, warm-up gigs they did before Hyde Park. Right. And we eventually meet about an hour later at his camper van. And it's amazing. They're staying in a five-star hotel. Every car in the parking lot is like Mercedes, like Rolls, Jag, Pete's camper van. <laughs> Stand out <laughs> a million miles. <laughs> and we do this interview and he's like, oh man, he's driving and he's not a great driver. 6 a.m. He's, he's definitely not sober. And uh, he's driving while swigging from a bottle of Smirnoff ice, a big bottle of Smirnoff ice. And I'm just like, oh my God, we, we're like going off on pavements and stuff. People get arrested here. And like, they're probably going to search his caravan and they're probably going to find stuff. I don't know what's in here. And it's just chaos. 
And we eventually did this interview somewhere in Glasgow at like 7 a.m. And it was one of those moments where it's amazing. Suddenly you're sitting down and he's just, he's full of clarity and depth and humanity. He's a lovely, lovely guy. I do want to stress that. He's a really, like, I've always found him to be really nice. But his life is just chaos, absolute chaos. So getting that interview is like a 24-hour process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That sounds mad. <laughs> it was crazy. But they're all like yeah. that, Pete. You know, like I did another one at like 5 a.m. in his hotel room after a gig in London. And getting mm -hmm. out of the gig venue, he just walked out the front door 10 minutes after he finished playing. So it's like thousands of fans everywhere. We, he hails a cab. Luckily, one was passing. And we get into the cab and it's like Beatlemania. Kids like throwing themselves <laughs> over the front of the cab. I've never seen anything like it. Then we get to the hotel and he just sort of won't do the interview straight away. So he sort of drags on and drags on and drags on. And finally, I get him up to the corridor uh, at like 5 a.m. And he just sort of collapses on the floor. And he's like, I've forgotten the key to get us in the room. <laughs> so we're stuck outside his room. Finally, someone comes up, Cassie, and I think his girlfriend, with the key to let us in. And this room is like, it's like a bomb's gone off in it. There's like broken glass on the floor there people's passports are everywhere for some reason there's typewriters he's been doing blood paintings and i'm like really wary of like stepping on something and like cutting my foot or something like that but then again we sit down on the bed and he's got a guitar and he's strumming away and he's just he's full of amazing words that tumble out of him yeah uh, do you think he kind of thrives in the chaos kind of thing i don't know i don't know how happy he is right um i think maybe he's happy i think there's an mm. oscar wilde story called the happy prince which carl always references which is about someone i think it's about someone whose life is chaos but in the heart of it they're they're perfectly happy maybe right. it's like that but i mean he's, yeah. he should be happy because he's written some great great songs over the years no definitely it seems to be a bit more settled now that like yeah, Libertines are still playing gigs and stuff, aren't they? So. I think he looks like he's in a good place. I know like the tabloids are on him about his weight and stuff, but fact is, you know, drug addicts are thin. And the fact that he's put a few pounds on suggests to me that he's probably in quite a good place uh, drug-wise. And I'd rather that than <clears throat> him be a heroin addict for the rest of his life. No, definitely, yeah. I mean... Yeah, the fact he's still here is just, mm. <laughs> it's a bit of a mm. grim thing to say, but it's probably a bonus in itself. Yeah, Shane McGowan as well, though. Is he still a guy? with him. Yeah, just, he's on Instagram. <laughs> no <whack>. way. <laughs> Check his Instagram out. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I went on like a YouTube wormhole of him not so long ago. Oh, he's, he's, he's so good, mad. though. He's such a legend. He's, so, he's good wordsmith. He knows his poetry and his... And his music as well. He's one of the first punks, wasn't he? He's one of the yeah, first yeah. Sex Pistols fans. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. I'm off to, uh, I live in Sale and John Lydon's doing a, a talk here in September. So I'm going to go to that, I think. Yeah, that'll be good. Should be good. Right. Um, yes. Uh, who would you like to interview that you haven't interviewed already? Lee Mavers from the Lars. Right. Okay. Who. Well, I actually met Lee through Drew McConnell when Lee was playing in a version of the Lars with Drew as bassist. Oh, right. And I, I knew Drew a little bit then, and I think I sort of strong-armed my way into Drew introducing me because I'd text him and be like, you've got to hear this unreleased Lars song. Get him to record this one. There's so <laughs> many unreleased amazing Lars songs. And I think, I think I got a text from Drew being like, right, we're doing a secret gig. Camden, turn up, stick around after dot 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 i.e i'll try and intro you and he did bless him and he <laughs> i mean lee I, I, he didn't say i was from enemy or anything like that he just said this is matt he's a fan so i don't think we wanted to freak lee out and uh he was he was pretty cool i mean he's quite out there i think lee he's quite kind of psychedelic i guess noel would say um but he was he was amazing i carried his guitar out to the 
to the street as like a roadie type thing. Like, can I help you carry out anything? He's like, yeah, here's my guitar. To take it out to the van. Now. <laughs> and I was like, oh my fucking God, it's my guitar. I had a quick burst of like, there she goes on it or something. But he was great. But I would love to sit down and really shoot the breeze with him because I just think he's so interesting. How do you write a five-star album and then just disappear for 30 years and not follow it up? Can't really think of anybody else who's done that. He's so unique for doing that. And I don't know what he's like now. I don't know what, I don't know whether he's happy, whether he made enough money to survive, whether he's had to work and do other stuff in the past. I've got no idea, but he's, I guess he's, he's an enigma, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, no, I tried to get Drew on, but he said he's not up for it at the minute. So hopefully get him on at some point. Cause I think he's quite unique as well in terms of mm. his career. Well, he's amazing because he started out playing in emo bands. Yeah. He wasn't really part of that lib scene. And then obviously kind of becomes Pete's right hand man. And I think him, I think Pat Walden was probably the best British guitarist of that generation. And I love the Pat interview that he did as well, actually. It was amazing to hear him. And he seems like he's in a really good place now. Yeah. But Drew, when Baby Shambles kind of died down a bit, Drew was doing really weird session stuff, like playing for Rebecca Ferguson on X Factor and stuff. All right. it, was, it was really odd and it was like wow I mean you can't be enjoying that but obviously I guess it it pays the bills of fair play and then suddenly it gets the Liam call which is a great look it's kind of like yeah you're kind of set if you get that you know you're going to have like 18 months tours you're going to be part of a very well planned out and well thought out machine it's going to pay well fair play I'm pleased for him yeah it must be he's, walking he's a, the park to be fair Oh yeah, he's a great bassist as well. I've got to say, he's really talented. Mm. So, um, no Gallagher's interview on Jules Holland, where yeah, he said the uh, the bassist from the Coral just rang him and was like, "Sorry, yeah. going solo, can I be a bassist?" He was like, "Yeah, right." Scousers, <laughs> that's, sc- that's so scouse though. Just like, "Oh, you're gonna ring him, Mike." <laughs> Fucking love that lot. <laughs> that's it. Um, I mean, he's given us. You know, great stories, especially like the Pete Bucky interviews. But is there another, I don't know, funny story, a memorable story about a big name in music? Um, so I, I'll tell you a story that I heard about Liam that I love. Right, great. But this isn't, I wasn't here at this point, so I can't uh, confirm it. And it's about, I think it's the mid 90s. I think it's when Oasis won all the Brits. So, like 96. Liam's in that coat and he's got a beard and he just looks mad. And they're like, it's the one where they're on stage and they say all this shit. Or you always see it on like Instagram algorithm or whatever. And the story that I heard is that after the awards ceremony, they were walking out or something like that, walking to the after party. And I don't know if, if, if you've ever been to an awards ceremony, they, like, they look like it's the glitziest thing ever. And that room is really glitzy, but outside that room is always just like fucking backstage at a car park. It's just like trucks driving around and like people moving like boxes and amps. And it's very, very unglamorous. And I think the story is that the Brits had tried to kind of glam up the outside areas a little bit. So they put like little areas with plants and like volivants and whatever. And there was this area with statues as well. And Liam was walking out and he was really kind of tanked up and on one. And kind of that thing of like excited but aggressive Liam. Do you know what I mean? That kind of... Yeah. That thing, that place that he gets to. (laughs) Apparently the story is that he sees this statue and decides to run up to it and lamp it and whack it. Properly like launch into it for some reason because he's just mad. And the only issue is... It wasn't a statue. It's a living statue. It was a bloke. <laughs> <laughs> so he knocks this poor guy out. No it's like, way. one minute, I was just pretending to be like a statue. Next minute, I've got Liam Gallagher running to me, beating the crap out of me for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know if that's true or not. But it's just so good. <laughs> that I, I really hope it's true because it's amazing. It is. I thought that was going to go down the route of him breaking his hand, but I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> what a legend. What an absolute legend. Even if it isn't true, I'm just pretending it's true because it's too good. 